Hi. Thank you. Thank you so much. Wow. What a wonderful atmosphere at this conference, right? So, so can you get the slides, please? So just while the slides are coming up, quick question. How many of you are already aware of generative AI, playing around? Yes, of course, everybody asks questions to chat GPT, but besides that, I mean, more seriously about your own uh, specific use cases. How many of you are building on AW, uh, on, on uh, generative AI? Just show of hands. None of my question would be around, you know, my presentation is slight, basically introduction to generative AI, so I can go as sort of a higher level and give you an introduction, really o introduction overview about what generative AI is, why there's so much of buzz about generative AI. And of course, this other part in terms of how you could enable yourself very quickly on AWS for your playing around and building your generative AI applications. So just want to get a show of hands, how much detail do I get into? Do you really want a high level introductory or do you want to go a little bit more deeper dive in terms of more practical aspects of it or whatever? Just show of hands, how many people want it to be a very good overview just to really go back with an intention of understanding what generative AI is all about, what it can do for you. How many of you want a little bit more of an overview? Just show of hands. Oh, geez. Okay, a lot of them. So, okay. So, so basically, you know, uh, uh, first I mentioned that, uh, you know, just hold on, you know, uh, questions to the later half. I would say they can make it interactive. Just show of hands, I can stop. And if you think I'm going a uh, very deep dive, I'll stay, I'll come up. If you think I'm going very high level and go deeper dive, ask me a question, I'll deep dive. So I'll make it very interactive. And my slides sort of will support me in terms of, you know, I can go a little deeper, I can go stay above at a higher level so that this usefulness of your, uh, the presentation becomes a one hour, small, short time, and a lot to cover. Uh, generative as a vast subject. So let me go that way then. Thank you, thank you so much. Okay, so quick introduction. So. My name is Anurag and I'm the principal AI ML advisor for AWS startups. I work with start all AI ML startups across India and Asia Pacific, uh, helping them on their gener uh, AI gen journey, both from a technology scaling as well as go to market perspective. I come from a hands-on technology background, uh, three decades of experience. I've designed chips. I've been at Motorola, Freescale. I, designed, I was part of the power PC design, uh, chip design, which went into the earlier power compute. And then of course, last decade has been more around AI taking a lot of AI ML quick, you know, production uh, cases to production, computer vision, and more recently it's been generative AI. So pretty much a hands-on technology. So what's happening in AI ML? So it's basically we're at an inflection point. An inflection point because we've been hearing about AI ML, it has gone through ups and downs in terms of what we call the winters, two winters of AI, where huge, ex you know, excitement, certainly excitement goes down because of limitations of what it can do for you or overhyped or whatever. Uh, but this is the third sort of a big wave. and Given that I've seen al almost at least uh, two of those wheels before, I think this is here to stay. Something different is happening this time. And the reason is basically about the capacity, computing, uh, compute capacity increase. You know, at the risk of diverging my age, I was the, one of the first people researching on neural networks in 1989, 90. And I bet and I was doing my master's dissertation. One of the few people who were researching. So core fundamental, which is called the back propagation algorithm, hasn't changed in three decades. What has changed is that when I was running my, my session, my, my, my machines, I had a five cross five network because that's the only thing with 8086 processors that could take. But today we're talking about billions of parameters. So we moved from our 20, 30, 40 parameters to billions of parameters and that's what has changed. So in terms of, you know, but what is generative AI? I mean, AI ML is all fine. We've been hearing this word for last 10, more than two, a couple of decades. We have had some good use cases like, you know, computer vision, you know, autonomous driving, all the stuff which you do, you know, you know, you, you know in Amazon when you do your, your shopping carts, right? What recommendation engines, they're all AI. But what's, so it's been there for a while, but what is so different about the generative AI? Anybody wants to hazard a guess? What is so different? In the last one year, or a little less than a year, we've been hearing this term generative AI. What's so different about generative AI? What is generative AI? Any guesses? So what we have seen so far in the last couple of decades has been around when the traditional AI ML, as we call it, it's about, you know, prediction. You, you have data, based upon data, build models to predict what's going to happen in the future, the weather forecasting or stock market forecasting, right? That's one aspect of it. Regression algorithms and other more complicated algorithms, nonlinear algorithms to be able to predict 
accurately based upon the previous data. Or you do some, you know, what classification as they call it, right? Customer segmentations. Or you look at, you know, given computer vision is a segmentation problem that, hey, there's an object. You can recognize the object, right? So we have done very good at that. But what has happened in the last couple, last year or so, is been the giving AI the capability to generate human like content. And when it's able to generate human like content, whether it is, you know, text, as you, as you do with chat GPT, or it is, you know, image, images or videos or all that stuff, or even code for that matter now, even music now, and even, uh, you know, drug research, drug, you know, drug molecules. When you're able to generate like human like content, that's the reason what, that's what is fundamentally transforming. And that's what quote, the term quote unquote generative AI, it's able to generate human like content. And again, needless to say, the last year has been a, you know, uh, a year of generative AI. And look at the numbers which are coming from Gartner's and other analysts of the world. They're saying that generative AI will usher $7 trillion increase in the economy in the 10 years, purely because of the productivity gains it will usher across all the names. Whether you're a software developer coding, whether you're a, you know, writer writing, or you're a marketing or a copyright guy doing some, you know, writing some advertisement sort of, you know, you know, copyrights, or generating music, generating images, generating videos, anywhere you go, or even doing drug research, right? Or even so any area you're in, generative AI will impact productivity, and that productivity gains are going to usher in seven trillion dollars in the next ten years. That's phenomenal, and that's exactly what generative AI is going to do to you. So again, just uh, in interest of time, let me go back to a little bit of history. So this gen quote and quote generative AI, especially on the text model, started with a seminal paper which came in 2017 called Attention is All You Need. Now what this did is essentially allowed you to create a very, very detailed semantic interpretation of languages. So for example, if you have, a, in English, you have a sentence called the food was great, but the service was terrible, right? So it essentially means that every word when it appears in context, for example, if I say I go to a river bank, or I can bank on you, right? Or I, I, I go to bank to withdraw money. The bank is, means different in this context. You get that? In one case, it is a bank where you go withdraw money. It, uh, other is a river bank. And third is uh, used as a verb that I can bank on you, right? So how do you do that? So again, that's where in context, when it, it is appearing, the relationship between words becomes very important. And that's what this paper did, that it creates an attention mechanism for every word with every other word around it. Right? For example, food has relationship with word everything I'm hearing before and after it. And now when I make it, and this relationship makes it, if I make it multi-dimensional, one is that, okay, they mean similar. Other is they appear before or after. One is a causal relationship. One is this rhyme similarly. Now if I create a multi-dimensional, the ability for me to capture the nuanced interpretation of semantics of a language become extremely, extremely powerful. And that's what this paper did. And now, one thing I missed out is, of course, one aspect is the is the relationship between words in a sentence and stuff. But if I have a huge corpus, which is now available on the internet with Wikipedia and stuff, imagine billions and billions of sentences capturing every small nuanced usage of every word. And if I capture that into a network or a neural network or any other intelligent system, which is capable to capture that nuanced interpretation, uh, wonders begin to happen. And that's exactly what today's LLMs or chat GPTs or equivalent LLMs are able to do because of this. Funny part is that this happened in 2017. And when this paper came in, I was actually picking this paper up and was building some, okay, let's use this to do some automatic assessment of English essays, right? When you go to IELTS or GREs, you write essays. Can you do an automatic sort of a evaluation of essays? Wonderful results, right? When I do the essay assessment. But, you know, the, the power which came in through the chat GPTs and other LLMs happened last year. Gap of five years. So what happened in 2022? This paper existed in 2017 and forms the basis of every LLM, large language model as they call it. Right? But what happened in 2022? So I come from semiconductor background, semiconductor background, and what we've been living in the last three decades or four decades has been something called a Moore's Law. How many of you heard of Moore's Law? Just show of hands, Moore's Law. So Moore's Law says, great, Moore's law says that every year, the size of transistor which goes on your chip will reduce by 50%, and the cost every 12 to 18 months, and the cost will also reduce by 50%. And we've lived that in the last 30 years. Every time you feel you're hitting the physics, limitations of physics, 
You know how much is a simple thickness of an oxide layer when you do this transistor uh, uh, semiconductor fabrication? 10 nanometer, 10 Armstrong. 10 Armstrong means only two molecules. So how much can you go further down in terms of compaction? But there are different techniques like the, you know, the FinFETs and everything have come in which allowed you to meet that Moore's law. 20 years ago, we were doing a one micrometer design. Today, we're doing a four nanometer or three nanometer, two nanometer designs, right? So that's exactly what we have lived. But what I've, I've, I've lived that life, right? But what we're seeing in these baggage models is even an order of magnitude bigger, and that's called scale. So look at the size of how the models have increased. From within the last three years, it's been thousands of times increased in the size of the models. And that's what brings the capability to what you're seeing in chat GPT and other LLMs. Just the sheer volume of data which you used to train and the volume of the network or the size of the network and the parameters which is able to capture that nuanced interpretation of like and that's what changed everything. Even the original developers of LLMs when they came out, when they trained them on such large network and such large corpus, they were surprised at some of the properties which they started to exhibit. They didn't expect some of the wonderful properties they started to exhibit. And you can check the original developers who developed the original you know, LLM, large language model, and saw that that's exactly what happened, scale. So it is all about scale. The, large, the size of the model, the size of data corpus used to train that model. So this is, I'll just skip through some of these slides. This is a more technical detail, as I said, I'll keep it at a high level. So just to understand that there are three types of models typically. One is called, as I said, that using this attention mechanism, you're able to capture the small, small no, nuanced semantics of every language, every sentence, every word, every sentence in a language. So one aspect is called the encoder-only models. It encodes a semantic meaning. For example, if I say, I love Delhi, so it knows what this sentence means, what the words in the sentence mean, and cumulity of the sentence means, and, and that's captured in what's called an embedding. Okay? And that embedding will tell you, you can use it to do some sentiment analysis. That, hey, I mean, this means that sentiment is positive. I love Delhi means it, the semantic interpretation tells me, and I can build these sort of systems around that. These are called encoder-only models. You're encoding the semantic meaning of every word in a sentence. That's what happens. The other is, you know, you essentially have fill in the blanks. If you look, look at your primary school days, they will fill in the blanks. So other thing is you can learn what is the missing word over here. They're very good at that because it knows the context, it knows the interpretation, and it can predict what the next word, right? So that's basically what the encoder-only models are. Then they're what they're calling it the decoder-only models, and that's what today's most LLMs use. When you use ChatGPT, it's built on a decoder-only model. And what they're doing essentially is predicting the next sentence, the next word. For example, if I say my, the next likely word, likely word is name. When I say my name, the next likely word is appear is is, and so on and so on. And one of the beautiful part of that is traditional AI algorithms need labeling to train your data. That you have a set of data, you label. Here, it is auto-regressive because you have, you know, corpus of sentences available. That means you're predicting the next word, so you have the already pre-labeled data available. So they're called auto-regressive models. All you use is use a huge corpus of English language sentences or any other language, Indic languages or Chinese or, or Spanish or whatever, and just use that to auto-train auto the model. And that's exactly what you know, LLMs like ChatGPT do. They're only trained on next word prediction minded. They don't have any other sentientness available in it. They're only trained on the next word prediction. That what is my next word? What is the likelihood of my next word uh, in, in, with the probability, right? And that's these uh, called the decoder only uh, models. And then there are, of course, what they call it the transfer, the sequence to sequence models, which essentially has both combinations. It has a encoder and a which maps the interpretation in a, in, a, in a latent space, and then there are decoder which uses that to generate something out, right? Very good for language translation, because if you have an English sentence called "Where are you going?", you capture the semantics of it, and then you have a generative aspect of it which can translate it to Hindi. Very good in language translation. So these are the kind of models which are available today. Uh, when it comes to large language models. So, but only thing I want to highlight is that there is no sentientness in these models. All they're trained on is the next word prediction and so on. And that's exactly given the volume of data used to train, given the volume of the size of the thing which can, uh, models which can take in that level of detailed information, it's able to do something wonderful for you. And I'll show a little bit more. Other aspect I want to, again, I'll skip some of the detailing in there. But one thing I want to highlight is that similarly what happened is then when text models started to happen, then we said, okay, we can now, computer vision, we have uh, images, we can generate text from it, a description of images. Can we do the other way around? Can we do text to image? 
So those images, those, those, those models started to come, whether they are, you know, DALI or, or stability diffusion and stuff like that. So one technique used is called variable autoencoders. Now, without going into too much of technical jargons over here, one, only one thing I want to highlight over here is these are pr probabilistic models. So what ha what's happening is on the left side, when I'm training these models, for example, this is an image generation model. When I'm training the model on a large amount of images, large amount of data corpus of images, I'm not training it just the way I do for a computer vision models to recognize the object or whatever. I'm training it to pick up a probability distribution. Yeah, how are my, how is the, when you say N cross N matrix and I'm generating an image, how are, when I'm learning the set of images, I'm capturing the probability distribution. So when you, gen, when you basically do a text to image, when you give a text, generate an image of astronaut riding a horse, it maps to a probability distribution. Right? And that probability distribution which has learned from multiple thousands and millions of images it's been trained on. Now that's what happens. So when you've trained it, you essentially trained it into an embedding vector space, which is a latent space. When I'm asking it, okay, please generate an astronaut on a horse. So it maps to a probability distribution and then randomly, randomly meeting the probability distribution generates an image which looks like an astronaut riding a horse. But so they're probably similar. Every time you generate, it'll be a different image which will come out. It'll not be the same image, will not repeat because it's a randomly picking, uh, you're doing random sampling using the probability distribution it has learned. So uh, without going to technical jargons, needless to suffice, it's only good to suffice that they are probabilistic models, right? Other aspect, this is what if you use stability diffusion to generate images, you take about text, it'll generate an image. Now they also use similar, slightly different method. What they do essentially is that when they're training, they essentially learn a noising or denoising function. That you essentially take an image, keep denoising, keep noising it till it gets into white noise. You learn that noising function in the schedule, and then when you're generating it, you pick up a probability distribution and then you map it onto and start generating it from a white noise, and you sort of keep iterating over. This is the process of stability diffusion. You start with complete white noise, and you apply the learn uh, the 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 uh, uh, what's it called the the noising function in a schedule, and you start some, and slowly you come out with something which is which closest close to, which closely resembles the text that you're given. Again, probabilistic models. So this is about the text thing. You can do you know uh, uh, different models exist today for summarization, for Q and A, very major applications. So this is an important slide and one of my favorite slides. When I mentioned that the the volume, the the size of the models and the size of corpus used to model lends these models to some very interesting properties. What are those properties? Which even surprised the original developers. What are those properties? One of the properties is that what they call it, the good few short learners. That's a very little loaded term, but it's in simplistically what it means is, how do humans learn? When you train a kid, you tell, oh, this is a remote. And you show another remote, this is another remote. And you show a different kind of remote, this is another remote. And next time you tell the kid, well, nah, it looked like a remote, right? That's how humans learn. So they started exhibiting few short learning properties. That means when you prompt, as that's a word used today, when you ask a question into any LLM, that's called a prompt now, right? A context or a prompt. Now give a prompt, that prompt is basically, within the prompt, you can give you a few examples. I'll tell, okay, here is my, uh, you know, I love Delhi, the sentiment is positive. Or I hate you, the sentiment is negative. Or I'm going to go to the market, sentiment is neutral. I give these three examples with specific answers, it now learns. Next time you ask a question, it'll be able to answer it correctly whether sentiment is positive or negative. That's called few short learning. One short, two short, one short is one example, two short is two example, few short, k short is k examples. Only a handful of examples. Now that's very counterintuitive to how we have been training you know, AI algorithms. We require statistically significant data for you to make a model learn. And, 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 but here, because they're already pre-trained on such large corpus, a handful of examples make them perform so well. And that's one of the big properties which even surprised the original developers. They started exhibiting, consistently do. Give a few examples and that's the power of your, 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 your prompting. And then other pieces, side effect, and I kept highlighting that they're probabilistic models. So they're bound to hallucinate. That's the word used. That means they're bound to give you very incorrect results you know, some, something very random. And that's the biggest problem with LLMs today. They would give, they will hallucinate and they will not hallucinate because they're not good or well architected or whatever. That's their nature. Because they've been trained, however large data you use, there will be gaps in the probability distribution because it's a large latent space. 
There will be latent space which is a little crowded. There is space which will be completely you know, sparse. And if you ask a question which hits that sparse area, it will bound to hallucinate. It will give you some approximate results. As I said, it's only probabilistic, right? That holds what's my next word with certain probability, right? I think that's what happens on this. But that those are important properties to remember. One is a good property, few short learning. Other is not such a good property because they will hallucinate. You'll have to deal with hallucination as you deploy these models into production. Now, this is a very nice slide. Uh, I like it because this is the traditional models. What you do is you take data, you label them. In traditional AI, you label the data for every task at hand. Whether it's summarization, some QA generation, you label the data, and then you big different models with that labeled data. But here, what you're doing is essentially you only train one, pre trained it once into a foundation model, and that's all you do. Then you just do fine tuning or using prompting to be able to generate multiple tasks at the back end. Now, see how, how, how the whole transformation is taking place. You will, here, you will design different. You have to label the data for every task, train it for every different task, different models. Here you take a one single pre model, fine tune it for different tasks, use prompts to get answers for different problems, and you're up and running. See how it's going to transform how machine learning model, AI models can be deployed now. So I'll just quickly go through it. Some examples of what I mean, this I mentioned already, that this is a few short learning, that I give you three examples. Sentiment is positive, sentiment is negative, sentiment is neutral. Next thing, ask a fourth question, it will start answering correctly. This is interesting. They're good at what is called, they're not good at chain of thought prompting. Uh, they're not good at, you know, logic reasoning. So if I ask a question at the top, right, for example, it requires little logic. As I said, remember when I said it that they're only next word prediction algorithm, right? So in that context, the reasoning just doesn't seem very well, right? But what I could do is I can, Take, I can give prompt, which is more like a chain of thought. I'll tell them how to answer, arrive at an answer. It learns that because of short learning properties and starts behaving and starts sort of, you know, next, first question I ask, very wrong answer, random answer. But then I gave it a chain of thought without going into details, or oh, this is how I will arrive at the answer. And the next time I ask the same question, it applies that logic which I've given him and gets it a better reasoned answer. Although by default, they're not trained to reason. They don't reason, they're only next word predictors, as I call it. I'll just skip through it. This is basically what you could do is fine tune. You have a pre-trained model, which you train on a large corpus. Very small data, you can take it and fine tune the model to perform uh, you know, different tasks at the, end, at the back end. I'll just skip some of these slides. These are essentially giving the fact that, uh, you know, just to give you a, give an idea, about if I have a little, they're very hungry on, on, on compute and memory. Every time you pre-train this large model, just to give an example, that don't go to the details, you know, memory to train a 1 billion parameter model and chat GPT original version was about 300 or whatever, 40 billion parameters. 300 times bigger than this. You require 80 GB memory to train that model. Just to hold the variables in there because they're large matrices and stuff like that. So that's sort of very power hung, very, very compute and memory hungry. Just to give you an idea. Now if I lowered the precision from a 32 bit to a, you know, uh, you know, and basically, you know, See, the, here is, if I go lower the position, so what we do essentially is, one technique used is called quantization. So instead of a 32-bit, you know, floating point number, I could do a, you know, 16-bit, I can do an 8-bit, I can do an 8-bit, I can do a 4-bit integer number. So in that case, I'm reducing the size and computation requirement to go that. So those are of course, there'll be some loss of accuracy, but the techniques are aimed to see how we can, with minimal, lo minimal loss of accuracy, I can do quantization and, and, and get better, uh, reduce my memory as well as compute requirements. I'll just skip this slide. Now, issues with pre-trained LMs, you mentioned in hallucination. Other piece is lack of current information. The model was trained one month ago, two months ago. So if you ask any question on current events, it doesn't have any idea. Or your own data, which is for an enterprise, you know, or a telecom company, you're doing something, your current data is not visible to it. It's just trained at a particular date, and that's all it knows. And anything else, is, it doesn't have any access to. How do you handle that, right? And so, and lack of reasoning, we saw that. And of course, the model explosion is happening. So I'll just keep quickly current, to, just quickly moving on to the, uh, you know, key use cases. So if you look at it, not a single domain is spared. Every domain is impacted by generative AI. On the left side is the text models, whether from text note taking, when you're doing your notes, summarization, a meeting happens, it picks your trans transcribes, your, whatever, is, uh, whatever is spoken, transcribes into text, and it summarizes for you, create action items for you. 
see all that stuff from a marketing copyright generation to you know e email lead generation to chatbot chatbots are the biggest use case the q and a you know and so and so on right and then code the we have, you, amazon has something called a code whisperer it's a coding companion so write a comment it'll generate the code for you see pass in you know, python whatsoever right so the productivity improvement in measure is up by 57% for developers so just give a comment it give it gives you even security vulnerabilities you give a code it'll tell you oh, there are these problems in the code because there are security uh, gaps in there and stuff like that and how you can fix them so that's on the coding side right image generation is again use case you've seen you know so many of the creative guys now waking up to the whole power of generative ai to generate at least starting point and the productivity to, to, to generate you know creative art goes significantly up speech speech transformations video video personalization how many watched the Shah Rukh Khan uh, Cadbury's ad last year, last Diwali? Anybody remember? Anybody watched that? It was Shah Rukh Khan uh, make an ad campaign last year in Diwali. Cadbury's. So, say, very interesting thing. What it, have, what it did was that Shah Rukh Khan recorded once. The, the, he shot the whole video sequence once. And then using generative AI, so they allowed local street, local vendors to generate their own personal ad where Shah Rukh Khan will take the name of the local street, local vendor. Like whether it is a, you know, you know, you know, evergreen sweet shop. So it can go ahead online and generate a Shah Rukh Khan ad on uh, Cadbury's and saying, okay, ab ki bari ab shopping uh, evergreen sweets, Noida se kiji. Right? And millions and millions of people went and, and it's like Shah Rukh Khan advertising their own company directly, their own, 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 you know, small, you know, entity in one corner of a city or something like that. And that's all generative AI. Of course, with all the legalities covered and everything, but the fact is, look at the ease of what it could do. And you could do the lip syncing change and everything as he uttered the words or, 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 or names of the local stores and so on and so on. So that's sort of, and of course, that's only a starting point. A lot can happen in the video space, right? Uh, one of my favorite use cases is healthcare. You know, we're running a cohort right now at AWS of uh, generative AI startups. One of the companies is actually using generative AI to do drug research. Now, you know how much a drug uh, uh, you know, researching a drug costs and taking, getting a drug into, uh, into a part of clinical trials, into, into production. How much is the budget? How much does it cost? One single drug. Any guesses? I'll take any guesses. From the world, any guesses? We are being interactive, guys. 100, 100 crore. It costs you $2.6 billion today to do a, get a single drug in the market. Now, if I can reduce, and what does it cost? Of course, there's clinical trials and stuff that I can't avoid. But one of the bigger problems is the initial sort of uh, analysis of different molecules, different drug, or what they call it, candidates. So molecular candidates come in and they sort of look at analyzing toxicity and all that stuff, right? It takes a long time. The more the number of those candidates, the longer it takes to really manage the, the you know, toxicology simulations and everything. And then it's okay, now it can go to, you know, uh, simulate that, and now it can go into clinical trials and so on and so on, right? If I can reduce the time, and generative AI does that, if I can reduce the time by 10%, 20%, look at the product, the cost of drug is just coming down significantly. I can't avoid the clinical trial. That's a standard process. FDA is where I, have, I would have. But I can avoid, I can speed up the analysis of the molecules. And that's already happening. So one of the companies in my cohort today, which I'm running as part of AWS, is doing that. For small molecule, big molecule, they're using all of that, using generative AI to generate that. Again, uh, music generation. Another company in our cohort this week is generating music. Now again, idea is that if for people who use the background music, you know, it's copyright violations that are a problem, right? How do you get small timers to use a background for my any production I'm doing? Now they're generating music which is uh, copyright free using generative AI. So you can go there, tell the mood which you want, tell the beats you want. It generates the music free, you know, license free, and you can use that into your production of whatever videos, whatever movies you're making, right? But again, generative AI. So again, I haven't seen any any. You pick up any domain, and generative AI is having a huge impact. Being in uh, the IMC here, so there are project, projection is that most of these telecom providers would uh, need, would basically will go up 50% upwards in terms of use of AI for their solutions. And some of the solutions right here, that interactive customer experience using generative AI, using conversational chatbots, from improving network performance, right? How do you simulate? Synthetic data is a huge use application use case of generative AI. So when you're going to do your simulations of your network, you know, you need a lot of data, right? Sometimes even proprietary data. So how do you manage that? So synthetic data allows you to generate real, 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 real looking data 
without copyright issues, and you, you, can, you can use that to fine tune the network performances and so on, right? You know, again, hyper personalization, you know, the, the you know, generation of, you know, uh, sales or B2B offers, huge amount of value uh, which telecom providers can leverage and integrate to take care. So switching gears now, that's sort of a very high level introduction. Any questions, I'll pause there. On any, or any insights on generative AI per se as a, as, as a technology. Then I'll move into how what's AWS is doing and how you can accelerate your play, your experimentation or playing around with generative AI on AWS. Any questions before I move in? So I covered them in the first slide. So essentially, in, in, in traditional AI or ML, are you essentially are using it for a prediction? that you have in the current data for the last historical data, and based on historical data, you can generate predictions, whether there are stock predictions, weather predictions, you know, or whatever, or whatever. So that's a predictive algorithms. They're good at it, they're doing it very well. Recommendation engines, you know, you look at amazon.com or amazon.in, the recommendations come in, they're powered by generative, based upon the previous data on what you've been buying, right? And then, of course, there's also an aspect of segmentation, which is the other piece classification, that here is the kind of user who does these electronic shopping. He is a user does this kind of shopping, right? And that's also used for computer vision, that here is an object, here is a you know, animal, here is a car, here is a vehicle or whatever, or here is a human being. Those are all classification or predictive algorithms. Generative AI is different because the first time in generative AI, it's defined as when AI can be used to generate human-like content. So previous cases, we're not generating any content. We are only classifying, we are only recognizing, or we're only predicting. Here we are generating. The content could be text, as we saw in the text, could be images, could be videos, could be music, could be molecule candidates for your drug. Right? Anytime we are generating human-like content intelligently, smartly, that is generative AI. So quickly moving into, uh, from AWS perspective, we see there are four pillars of why AWS, how AWS is looking at enabling you know, uh, users uh, play around and experiment and take, leash the, unleash the power of generative AI. The first is making it easier way, easy, easiest way to build. Right? How do you build, right? So one of the things which we essentially have launched is uh, it's not working. Okay. okay, the bedrock. We essentially announced something called bedrock, and the the critical things which we, are, we we believe is in democratizing, right? So it's not only a single model. We believe every we, you will use different models for different applications. So underlying bedrock, we have multiple models which get access to an API, serverless. You don't have to manage your GPUs or and instances of you know machines or you know and so cloud instances and so on. It's all API based. But under the hood of APIs, you have multiple models, our own Titan models, which are uh, you know which have been built with 20, 30 years of research on data which we've been capturing around uh, you know text. They're text models. Then we have third-party models like Anthropic. Uh, Anthropic is doing very well with the models like Cloud V2. The kind of context length it can handle and the kind of capability it exhibits are very, very powerful. Uh, we have stability here. Those are the image models, so text to image generation. We have Cohere and AI21. There are some of them are multilingual. Some of them are very good at summarization. So they put a different task. So idea is to create a mechanism for you to avail you know, you know, multiple models which are suiting. And even for a single use, single enterprise, we believe they would use, you as enterprise would use multiple models for, differ, for, for handling different sub-problems of your domain. A single model may not suffice. You may use one model for doing A. You know, one of our, you know, again, as I said, I'm running a startup cohort for generative AI. So one of the companies is doing paralegal, right? The paralegal, would, they have trained models, different models for different aspects of paralegal. One is referencing the statutes, other is referencing the previous decisions from the high courts and supreme courts. They have built and trained different models for different such sub-applications within the parallel. And that's what we believe. Very important to create different models under the hood. Same API, so your programming interface doesn't change. Just switch the model which you want to use for whichever application or sub-problem you're trying to solve. Other important element on Bedrock is essentially, you know, one of the biggest, again, I mentioned the Titan models. So some of the customers using Bedrock. Now, another important element of Bedrock is because more people would fine tune the models. One is off the, off the, uh, you know, uh, off the shelf. Other is you'll use your own data to train and fine tune these models. So people are concerned. When I'm using API and I'm using an API, how do I train my, or fine tune my model? What happens to security of my data? So in Bedrock, what we're doing is basically we're allowing you to use APIs to train, but the data comes on to you, stays in your VPC. 
is protected so using your VPC. The model which gets sort of a, you know fine-tuned using your data also serves from your VPC. So you're, you're inherently protected for your data which you upload for fine-tuning and when you're serving those models, only it's, 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 unique, to, it's unique to you and it's, it's basically served through your uh, you know, uh, VPC. Now, foundation models alone cannot do the task. We made so many foundation models available to you and you can play around, you can fine-tune some of those and so on. The biggest thing is that you would need multiple things to be done. You need to do orchestration of these models, different models, when to orchestrate which model, right? You need to essentially configure uh, fine tune with your own data. You need to sort of do a lot of API sort of calls based upon integration with your applications. And then you have to manage the cloud in terms of how the whole uh, security and other things are happening, right? So for that, what we have essentially the platform is a lot of agents. As I said, agents are supposed to be like, you know, a, a big a platform where, uh, where you know, you could, it's like a semantic sort of a, you know, kernel of sorts, if you allow me to use that word. So in that context, based upon the questions or, you know, your prompts coming in, you can decide. You can decide the intent on those prompts. And then you can invoke different sort of uh, intents uh, in different, uh, different tasks for managing those inferences. And all of that, you know, can be done through agents within the bedrock. So you could essentially do orchestration, which model to call when. You can in embed other things in, for example, uh, leveraging your own data, right? How do you manage your own data? So building some sort of a, uh, augmentation models where you can refer to your data. All of the stuff is enabled through agents in Bedrock. And I already sort of preempted that. We believe differentiated is your data because models are accessible by all, right? The same models will be available by all. They're all by default, right? So your differentiated is your data. And AWS basically has one of the largest sort of a comprehensive, most comprehensive, uh, you know, uh, you know, platform from your data management, whether it's data sort of a building data pipelines, cleaning your data from storage, from, 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 from uh, you, know, uh, you know, managing the data, clean, cleaning the data, building a pipeline, building models, and then of course, deploying it and stuff like that. So it's a, you, you essentially have a variety of, you know, so the widest, have comprehensive, most comprehensive sort of a, you know, uh, you know uh, platform on, on, on your data management. And the key thing is, you know, you have to build you have to bring the model to where data is. So if you've already been using some of these services on data storage and data manipulation, data cleaning, you know, and data manipulation and so on, you would rather bring the model to where data is instead of taking the data of the way the model is gonna be. So that's the one of the big powers which we have, that the entire data management aspect is most comprehensive. So if you already have that, bring the model over here and it's, it works seamlessly from S3, from different services and so on and so on. Other pieces, you know, I mentioned about, talked about the uh, you know the attention mechanism as i said it's a multi so it's a multi dimensional vector so when the when you store the semantics of every sentences words in llms and so on these are high dimensional vectors so the, another element is essentially how do you uh, when you build something on your own data for example the one comp i'll just skip the slide let me go through this so what we essentially do is you have the sentence Using the embeddings, which they call, which is attention mechanism, you convert into a multidimensional vector. So this sentence on the left is converted into a multidimensional vector, which represents the semantics of that. That's what we call embeddings, which is the multidimensional attention mechanism we talked about. And these vectors essentially give you on, and again, this is right now two dimensional. You're seeing that, you know, dogs and puppies are together, words which are meaning similar are together. Others have a larger vector distance between them. Now you transform that into a two-dimensional, into a multi-dimensional vector, right? Now you have maybe n dimensions. Now you are essentially saying, if I now measure the vector distance between these, I can measure the pro proximity of these words and sentences on a much larger dimension. And that's the smallest nuances of semantics which are captured. Now that's one of the powers of LLM. So LLM's two power. One is ability to sort of embed the semantic meaning of your words and sentences. Other is the ability to generate, right? And both are used, in this case, when I do a, for example, if I embed this meaning, and now I do a search. If I do a standard search, for example, if I search for a golf shoes, on the left side is a standard search. It will give you everything, right? The search for, you know, stretcher for golf shoes, your know, golf shoe bag, everything is coming in. But if I do a semantically correct and a smart search, I would get specific, very, very specific because Golf shoes means golf shoes from an embedding standpoint. So that's sort of what embeddings do to you. Now I combine them. 
What happens is, for example, you have a large amount of corpus. Now, that's very interesting to hear. It's called retrieval augmentation, augmented generation. Now, if I ask an LLM about something, for example, you have a lot of documents, previous documents in your enterprise. Now, if I ask a question about anything, LLM would not have any idea about your own documentation, right? But it will not give you a, I don't know, it will give you something because it depends upon how it's been trained. It will give you something which is what we call hallucination, if something which is absolutely incorrect. Now, that's where we use something called retrieval augmented generation. What we do is use the power of LLM in which it will be able, when the question is asked, it will convert into embedding. So it now has a good interpretation of what question is being asked. right? Because embedding is one of the powers of LLMs. You embed it into a vector. You have now encoded a semantics of the question. Now, parallelly, what I've done is I take the entire corpus of your corpus, you know, all the PDFs, other corpus of your documentation, which is local to your enterprise, and also embed them into the similar vectors and store it to what's called a vector database. Now, question comes in, I can do a vector database lookup. What is the nearest match? When I'm asking this question, what is the nearest match on the corpus which I have stored in your thing? I use that corpus out and I give it to LLM. Hey, Mr. LLM, please find an answer from this corpus and not from whatever you may have been trained on earlier. And that's called the TV logarithmic generation. Extremely powerful. Most applications in production today are using one form or the other of the TV logarithmic generation. And they're powered, again, using both the powers of LLMs. One is uh, accuracy of embeddings, the ability to semantically you know, understand the sentences and questions being asked, answers being given, and also being able to generate a rightful answer which makes very meaningful from a human standpoint. That's sort of, uh, you know, and we, we have agents which are able to do that within Bedrock. Very easy to build within a matter of few API calls. You can actually get your, you know, again, we are, all our databases now support vector database, vector, 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 vector support. So there are specific databases like pine cones which have been announced, which are now what happens is either you, if you have your transactional data in one of your RDBMS, which is like a Postgres or whatever, right? And now you want to extract there from there and create another vector database, you have to manage two different databases. What we've done at AWS is or most of our you know, offerings are now supporting adjacent vector storage. So whether it is uh, Amazon Aurora for Postgres SQL or Amazon RDS for Postgres SQL, we have vector support right there, there itself. So you co-locate, avoid du duplication and avoid the man you know, management of multiple databases just because you have to have vector search. Similarly, there's an open search service besides the you know, Postgres SQL exhibiting you know, or, or uh, having you know, vector database properties. We have an open search service which has existed for a long time. Again, it allows you a common, uh, you know, a vector search similarly. And, but it requires some expertise to manage it. What we have done essentially is we announced also a serverless version of it, which you don't have to manage the services. You can now do a, a you know, serverless you know, uh, open search for, for vector databases. The next piece, next uh, pillar, as I call it, is the infrastructure piece, right? We saw very briefly how compute intensive these uh, generative AI models are, whether to train or even to inference. You may say training may be a bigger task. Yes, it is. Training is much more computer intensive. Yes, it is. But even inferencing, because the entire model has to be loaded. So your ability to be able to load that into the memory and having run it on a GPU, the compute requirements are as good, right? So essentially at AWS, we're saying that uh, uh, we have, besides the standard GPUs uh, from NVIDIA and so on, we also have our own uh, you know, uh, compute team, which designs our own custom silicon. So we have the widest variety from that point of view of uh, uh, price performance of, you know, these are the NVIDIA ones, whether it's H100 or A100 or A10G, these are standard NVIDIA servers, which are available uh, on, on AWS for you to use to, 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 to train and inference these models. But we also have announced our own custom silicon called Trainium and Inferential. And this gives you up to 40 to 50% improvement on cost when you uh, compared to like equivalent GPUs. And these are the custom hardware. And some of the customers are using it and, and giving very good thumbs up in terms of the performance, uh, low, low latency and high and uh, low cost, both. It's very difficult to get both. If you, if you reduce latency, your compute cost goes up because you have to be larger compute. Here, you're able to do both together. Right? The next thing is about the applications. So we have end applications. I did mention about these are the AI-powered applications. One of the first ones we launched was Code Whisperer. Code Whisper, as I said, is a coding companion. So it's basically able to generate code. So when you're giving comments, 
you know, and it can sort of use the comments to generate code. You have an existing code, it'll tell you the vulnerabilities of the code, that here the security vulnerabilities, gives you suggestions how to you can improve the code better, and so on. So get this, and we've done some experimentations. We're seeing that 57% productivity improvement when people are using Code Whisperer as, uh, as coding companion. Some of the companies we're using, as a reference is already a deployed, uh, you know, code, code Whisperer in the production. This is another interesting one. You know, I'm sure most of you, especially in the telecom space, use a lot of business in the insights, BI tools, whether it's Power BI or whether it is, you know, QuickSight. Uh, AWS has a QuickSight in it. What we're building in QuickSight, QuickSight has been existing for a while, doing your all dashboarding and all your business and intelligence and so on. What you build now and launching now is essentially an you know, ability to a generative AI companion to it. So you can now essentially, oops, you can essentially now ask give a chat interface to it, say, hey, say, here's a chart. Can you set the granularity to monthly, group by region, and regenerate the chart? So you have now a textual and capable. Look, look at the productivity improvement of your BI team, which is looking at that and being able to, within a matter of you know, seconds, you know, interact with and get. But what is even more interesting is things like these. It is able to generate story. For example, if I say, OK, here is a, on the right you see, create a narrative that can help sales team identify the free trial accounts that are most likely to convert in paying, to paying customers, use number of user, user sessions as the driving factor for strategy, but also include sales data and forecasts. How generic it is, right? Now it generates the thing on the left behind. It generates a full narrative, which is fully formatted with all the graphs and stuff in there and a narrative in there. So that's sort of what we are trying to do with business intelligence, getting business intelligence generative AI, AI-fied, right? Oops. Next thing I want to give you an example is basically uh, we launched something called a health scribe as a service. Uh, this is being used by 3M. The biggest problem is, I think I skipped the slides a little bit. Oops. So biggest problem today is basically when you go to a doctor and you have an interaction with him, you speak and stuff. Now, how do you cl generate clinical notes? Now with HIPAA and stuff, with all the new HL7 requirements in the US, you have to have clinical notes transcribed. Now they use different techniques. They use third, you know, eight people, uh, hire more people who do the transcription and doctor verifies it. It's time consuming because doctors want to minimize their time on doing this sort of note taking aspect of it. So what you build essentially is a health scribe. You essentially have a uh, voice conversation happening between doctor and a patient. That voice conversation is captured, transcribed into text, and from that it sort of picks that up using LLM and generative AI technology and generates a formatted clinical notes which requires a certain format. Like what are the chief complaints? What are the you know, uh, differential diagnosis? These are terms which are very medical terms. What are the ICT code, ICT-10 codes in terms of the, what are the disease uh, you're diagnosing, everything. It automatically maps it to it, HIPAA compliant, which is a Health Insurance Pri you know, Privacy Protection Act in the US, HIPAA compliant, which, and all that stuff like that. So this has been announced, 3M's using that in their health, health product and so on and so on. So look at how the impact we're having at every layer. So again, the wonderful part of AWS is looking bottom up and top down both. If, if you are a person developing you know, foundation models, we are focused right at the silicon, the how we can assist you to use silicon at a more efficient cost, the libraries around that to parallelize your training loads and everything. How can you make it sort of more lowest cost you know, training, training for you and the most reliable training for you at the bottom level? Now you look at top down, that if you are a not very heavy AIML guy, you want to use services, Code Whisperer. You want to use services, Health Scribe. So you're looking at from bottom up and top down both, right? Other pieces, if you want to build your own, uh, the flexibility to build your own foundation models. So I mentioned about the flexibility means you have, of course, you know, uh, underlying uh, a compute, bare compute. Use your bare compute and train it, no problem. But we also have something in the middle layer called SageMaker. So as SageMaker, what we have is you can build, a SageMaker has a lot of optimization libraries, a lot of libraries which allow you to speed up your training, tra training needs. Uh, parallelization, data parallelization, model parallelization, all that stuff libraries are available for you. If you are a heavy user of AI, ML, and generative AI, you can build that. You can fine tune the models. A lot of our customers today do not want to build foundation models from scratch. So if you're building from scratch, SageMaker allows you to do it faster and low, at a lower cost. If you're not a foundation model guy, if you want to pick up an existing model, we have something called SageMaker Jumpstart, where all the models, including all the open source models, the models which you saw from you know, uh, AI, AI 21 from even Llama 2, which is the Meta's models. Hugging Face has huge amount of 
open source models. Go here, stability, light on, Databricks, Alexa, our own uh, teacher models. So you have a variety of models available and being able to deploy at the click of a button. The control is, because here it's not AI, it's not API based. Bedrock was the API based. The difference between Bedrock and this is, this you manage your own, you have more control on managing your own costs, managing your own servers, how you want to run it and so on. So you manage your own load balancing and all that stuff, right? But, and, 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 and uh, Bedrock was completely serverless. All you manage is based on number of tokens, you generate price based on that. Here is price based on what your uh, compute costs are going to be. That's sort of the, the flexibility for you to build whichever way. Importantly, if you want to use an existing model and fine tune, you can do it here as well. You can do it in, you know, in, in Bedrock as well. But here, you have more control on how you manage and how you deploy. These are some examples of LG research use SageMaker to build their own uh, fashion model, which is image generation model. You know, Autodesk used some models which are able, which she's, which she's been able to ge generate, you know, air aircraft designs which are 45% lighter, which means that 93,000 cars are off the road uh, by doing that, right? By, by, by reducing the cost of fuel, uh, by making the aircraft lighter. Here's a small example, a video which I want to play in terms of how people are using. I'm very happy to be here with the Amazon team and to tell you about a new collaborative project we're doing with AWS and Amazon AI called the Brain Knowledge Platform. One of the biggest challenges with studying the brain is its pure complexity. It's inaccessible to study. At the same time, there's a lot of data about the brain. It's not organized or centralized in a meaningful way. So the Brain Knowledge Platform is, is really a knowledge base about the brain and a discovery platform. We need this map to know exactly what goes wrong in disease and precisely where to target therapeutics. We've been working with AWS to bring machine learning tools to automate segmentation and other types of techniques to analyze the data in the first place, eventually to discover new insights that are not obvious from this data. Also, the generative AI side of things has some unusual possibilities for us. We'll be able to integrate data of many different types and to begin to make inferences that human researchers are not capable of doing. I'm a neuroscientist, not an AI specialist, but I think we can begin to imagine the new territory that we're entering with generative AI as it may be applied to neuroscience. We can begin to understand how the brain actually works and to harness this knowledge for the good of society. So bottom line is start your journey today and how can you start? Uh, deploy Amazon Code Whisperer if you're coding. Use, start using Code Whisperer to improve your productivity and play around with you know, multiple fan notion models available on Bedrock and jumpstart either ways, right? You know, we essentially have a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of training material available. We have focused on building the capability as well from a skill building, right? So from, you know, AWS skill builder to other avenues where you can actually build, you know, free courses, we can learn from it. We have done low cost courses in collaboration with Coursera. So a lot of focus we're building on reskilling and, 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 and enhancing the skill set of the, of the workforce. And then get start with your POC. Don't delay it. Start with your POC today on use cases. We're very really happy to support multiple POCs across all the segments. So already as we speak, we are working, our teams are working very, very closely with the customers to help them build your first POC. Right? And so everything you need to accelerate your AI multi generative AI journey from foundation models, which are multiple foundation models, democratized way of working. Uh, generative AI services, we saw support Whisperer, HealthScribe, and so on and so on, increasing number. Purpose-built machine learning infrastructure, which is our own custom silicon, and of course, the widest variety of GPUs from NVIDIA, Intel, and so on. And education and training, important to accelerate your employee productivity. I'll pause here for any questions. I think I've kept reasonable time on my schedule, right? Any questions before I... There is a slight dem short demo. If you want, I can walk you through it. The interesting one, a uh, little older one. So essentially, how do you gen insight from images? So I'm uploading an image. It's a video, uh, playing a video very quickly, just in the interest of time. So you essentially pick up, it's a centrifugal pump, image of a centrifugal pump. So we're using a computer vision uh, algorithm called recognition services to really annotate the image. So it'll annotate the image. It's a centrifugal pump. Here is the inlet, here is an outlet. So that's what happened. So here is the uh, image uh, has been you know sort of uh, tagged in, and now I'm generating a summary using LLM. This is a this is an anthropic LLM. I'm using anthropic LLM to generate the summary of image. What does the image say? It's automatically generating using LLM, and then I can ask some questions around that. It's a version one called Claude. Claude version two is even more powerful, and it says what insights would you like to have? It says what's the purpose of suction head measurement, and it'll start uh, giving an answer. What's the purpose of suction head measurement? And basically, suction measurement determines the height of water supply to the pump. 
So again, it's automatically done just from an image. All you did was uploaded an image, everything happened automatically, right? One example. Now, this is a, a multi, this is, uses multiple, multimodal sort of things. It uses, you know, uh, avatar generation as well. So what you see essentially is that this is a, a report, which is for, you know, uh, analyst report, which has come in, which has been uploaded. So here is an avatar which got generated. And I can ask a question, you can type a message. The volume. Conversational financial analyst. I was created using Soul Machines and integrate with Amazon Lex, Amazon Kendra, and Anthropic Claude. You can ask me anything related to financial services. How can I help you today? EPS stands for earnings per share. The question asked what is EPS? It is a measure of a company's profitability Calculated using as the LNM for next generation and using avatar generation and video sort of standard. lip syncing to generate a video or a live looking video for the internet. So I can keep going on, but again, reimagine and transform your application with generative AI and AWS. I'll stop here for questions now. Final question. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, it was a wonderful session. So uh, from I'm Sachin. I'm from DreamSoft Innovation. It's a startup working on generative AI. So I've been into this from a couple of years. So I have this simple question. So now we have generative AI, content is being generated. So where do we draw the line? I think in coming uh, like five to 10 years, the world wide web will be filled with generative AI, AI. So should we build a tech to detect AI? Should we, be, should we worry about AI being filled, uh, the web is being filled with AI? So should be our focus. So there are two things. One is, uh, yes, a lot of content is generated using generative AI. We have to be cautious. Uh, I believe that most of the stuff will be around man in the middle. So it's going to be an assistant to uh, to an exist to an to an, to an author to improve the productivity to author any content. So it'll be most people are using it that way. That's how it's supposed to happen. Other part of your question of web being filled with, you know, uh, uh, there's a lot of effort on fake and the responsible use of AI. At, at AWS itself, we believe a lot in that in terms of content moderation, detection of you know fake things and stuff like that. So those are important elements. We have to go together. Some regulatory framework has to emerge as well around that. So we strongly believe that responsible use of AI is going to be very important. And the fact is, how do we detect some of these things? How do we, you know, uh, some of the, you know, un, you know, fake contents and wrong contents and all that stuff? They're going to be go hand in hand. We can't not let the productivity improvements, you know, not come in just because there is a negative element of, you know, of, uh, wrong or fake content being there. I think the technology is there for be able to sort of continuously build, you know, capability to continuously monitor and flag such content and so on. In fact, most LLMs today do that. Our LLM, for example, Bedrock, when you do Titan, the lot of focus on Titan is Titan is around, you know, detecting some of these, you know, you know. Do you, know, you watermark the content that is being generated? Sorry. Uh, like whatever LLM generates the, the text, do yeah. you watermark those so that you can detect? Well, because mostly in academia, that will be a problem, right? So I can, I can give you more details beyond that. But yes, I mean, there is, I mean, when you generate, for example, there are techniques available. If you don't have to watermark. For example, you're generating an image, right? A, an a, an authentic, original image when you're doing a camera and fix sensors, there's a lot of white noise there, right? Just use the noise patterns and you'll figure out. A, a, a synthetic image will never have those. Now you say, hey, can I use generative AI to even introduce them? There will be those mar mar automatic markers which are available for you to detect some of that. Because natural sort of a noise has a very different mechanism versus anything which is artificially done. Even though you may inject certain noise in it, that still be more, you know, uh, artificial or more sort of a systematic in nature. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, thank you. But good questions. Thank you. Thank you for that question. Hi, I'm Malik from NWDCO. So my question is, uh, I have my database. How do I connect the generative AI onto my database so that using some models, it can give answers to what my data is about. Maybe. Yeah, absolutely. Right. So I think what you saw with the RAG approach, okay. which is retrieval automated generation. Right. So that's the biggest thing, right? I mean, that's your data is your mode. Correct. I mentioned that a few times, right? Data is your mode because these models are available, which are generally general purpose trained on large motor corpus. So what you're going to get answers from there is what other, others are going to get, right? Yeah. Your mode is your data. On basis, your data, you generate more meaningful, more relevant, and more interesting content, right? So you build something called a RAG, right? RAG would have, can actually be taken in, uh, you know, through your databases and vector databases, 
your model, and maybe some sort of a meta information there as well. You build your text-based thing, you build your all the textual data, which is more, then there is, you have some numerical tabular data, you build it separately. You build that into your system, uh, into a vector sort of a search, and then you push, embed that using LLM queries. So which uh, service of AWS can I use for that? So you can, as I mentioned, you can use uh, you know, open search. Okay. Open search is one of the, uh, you can use Kendra. Kendra okay. is one of the uh, very powerful semantic search engines. It has connectors to all, it can do scraping from the web. It can do connected to multiple databases to get the data information out. And then it has a connector back into Bedrock. Okay. So you can from Bedrock invoke a, invoke a you know, agent into Kendra and say, hey, Mr. Kendra, please give me the retrieval based right. upon this question asked. What's the most relevant answer? Right. What's the most relevant corpus based upon this question which is asked? Correct. You get that corpus and you push that into LLM now, saying, Mr. LLM, use this corpus as context and answer question around using this context. Uh, okay. That's how you minimize hallucination because it's right. not speaking from its latent knowledge. It is Correct. not speaking from the data. content which you, the context which is you have provided, which is your data. Thanks. Thank you. Sir, I have a question regarding, uh, like you mentioned just now that there's an AWS service that can scrape the web. So my question would be that since the robots or the bots will be scraping the web, who would be responsible for compensating the content creator who posted their content for humans to view and view their ads and generate a revenue? Yeah. So let me correct. We don't have a service by default. We essentially using the connectors, you can build that. The responsibility is yours, right? I mean, as not AWS from that point of view, right? The responsibility is yours, how you scrape and uh, how... Even today, when you one of the big things is that we allow you to host those models over here. But if you use data which, you know, uh, which which is not copyright protected, the 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 accountability is the users, right? We essentially say hey, you, you we'll just allow you the platform to host that, right? So, and there are still questions. People are questioning that. I mean, you have a model hosted on AWS, maybe. But if you build that model on your own, the responsibility for you to be able to make sure the used. Uh, copyright pro protected data or, or copyright sort of, or we have the right licenses to use data, build that. The response lies with the customer, right? But it's important question that, you know, that a lot of questions are being asked. How do we, you know, people, when they're using any models, any, any enterprise using any models, they're asking this question. I'm using this model. How do I indemnify against such, uh, you know, you know, copyright violations for the images generated by this model, right? Uh, if 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 that model has been generated using non copyright protect or uh, non copyright protected or copyright protected images or data, then uh, the, the the then you can actually hear you can uh, you know you can be actually questioned why how you're generating that right. So again, that aspect we, we don't as AWS we don't take any call on that because that's something which is your responsibility. Building your models, fine tuning your models on your data or on third party data. The the, the legality of third-party data which you have used to build your models is yours. You see what I'm saying? All right. Thank you so much. Uh, wonderful being here. and uh, Best wishes. And thank you very much. Thanks for the platform. Really, thank you. Appreciate it.